Storyworthy Media, the best in story-driven content. Hey, it's Danny Klein Modisette, author of Take My Spouse, Please, and you're listening to Storyworthy. Welcome to the Story Worthy Podcast. Here are your hosts, Christine Blackburn and Hannes Finney. Welcome to Story Worthy. My name is Christine Blackburn and I'm here with Hannes Finney and we're coming to you from the Milwaukee Turners Hall, home of the Turners who are like Shriners. <laughs> And it's a place where you celebrate weddings, wedding anniversaries, bar mitzvahs. But what's a uh, turner? What's that mean? It's just like a shriner. I know, but is it, is it T-U-R-N-E-R? Yes. Like, I, I assume there are people who used to turn things. That is so stupid, I can't even take it. Listen. No, I'm just Wisconsin, saying. we care for the... Look, the Green Bay Packers are named after meat packers. Okay? Right. Mm-hmm. So somebody had to turn the crank on the meat grinder. Do you really think this is where, is where it comes from? I believe that is. That it. is because so there's, a, there's Midwest. like a big guy, like a sort of a gothic looking, yeah. like the Rockefeller Center, you know, Atlas guy, and he's turning a crank. Mm. It's exciting. Okay. Well, it's exciting to you be know, here. You know, it's podcast gold. The kids, they love All right, a 300 year old. I think the reason lodge. why Hannes would like us to be at a lodge where they celebrate wedding anniversaries is because of our guest tonight, Danny Klein Modisette. She's here, and her topic is wedding anniversary nightmares. Nightmares! Wedding Brr. anniversary nightmares. Now, when I hear this topic, of course, I go to my. 12 or how 14. many wedding? Yeah, <laughs> between your two marriages, how many wedding anniversaries did you have? You Let's know see. What's so funny is okay, so I maybe I've had 12 or 14 or 10, I don't know, but no, about 12 or 14. No, wait, wait. how long were you married for the first time? The, first, okay, the first time I got married, yeah. I was 25, and but it was such a sweet wedding, it really was. It was all outside, and there were feather, you know, not feathers, but flowers in my God hair, you damn know, damn hippies, very, exactly, very hippie. And I vowed to have a wedding anniversary party like that every year. Like I even knew at 25 oh, that God. you, if you, listen, and I'm talking to you, Hannes, if you just want to get married because you want to have a nice party and get presents, you can actually do that every year and not have to get married at all. Do you know what I'm saying? Wow, your your friends are going to get sick of that real quick. Like hey, you can we rent need more a silver. Space, but you can rent a space and yeah. cater a really nice party and have an event where people get dressed up and tell people you want presents, like for your birthday. <laughs> and they'll do that. You don't right. have to get married to do that. Yeah, but it's... Yeah, but that's not why you should be getting married. You know, that, that's my for presents. Yes. Okay. Well, that's what I'm saying to you. How many <laughs> wedding anniversaries have you had? Well, none technically. How many that uh, engagement by parties the... have you had? How many engagement years? Uh, listen, the, I am not on trial here. <laughs> what is happening is that we're discussing how many. Year, wait, how many years were you married okay, the so, first okay, time? Four so years? Let me get back to that. No, the fir- no, no, no. The first time, so I had, the, I got married, and then that very next year, May 18th, we had a first year wedding anniversary party, and it was a blast. It was fantastic. Right. It went so well, and that, that was my point, that you can have a really great party for not any, you know, not actually getting married. It could be the anniversary. Right. Okay, or birthday, whatever. The point is, the second year, by that time, he had already gotten another girl pregnant, and we weren't together anymore. So, so that that just burnt out and fizzled. You know what I mean? That just or fizzled out. So yeah, that, so you were actually married for less than two years to that. Yeah, guy. yeah. I didn't I don't know why I thought it was a little longer than that. Uh, no. no. No, it wasn't. It was very short. It was very short. He was in a gift giving mood. Mm. Obviously. So the second time I got married, uh, another nice wedding. And then uh, I think we did have some parties, some anniversary parties, but we never like we never put that much on it in terms of like us having to get away or make a vacation out of it. It was more like a reason to celebrate. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, did you I mean, okay, so did you have a did you do something every single year? For that, I don't. Uh, I, don't I think because I, I think after 
Yeah, you're the first one, and then and then you'd be like five and ten, and you'd be like, okay, these are important. But it seems like seven or eight, you might just be like yeah. Denny's, or even three Denny's? or four. Yeah, or you know, dinner and a movie. You know, I I, I don't. Yeah, see, it wasn't that, none of them were that memorable. Maybe that's why I'm not married anymore. I don't know, no, but I'm about to cry. No, I can't. No, no, stop crying. <laughs> There's no crying in podcasting. Well, anyway, no, I'm excited to hear oh, wait, Danny's story. There's nothing story but crying in podcasting. Because Danny has a new book, as you know, called Take My Spouse, Please. Who Take My Spouse, Please. And By the way, now, now the kids out there may not even know the reference of her joke, which is the any young man who is a great old old community he was old when when we were young which means he's dead now which is ironic that his last name was Youngman because ah, he was really an old man you know wow. what I mean wow interesting thank you yeah I wonder if he was, he was he's like Randy Dangerfield no, the, like it was hard to ever imagine that he had been young right ever right so his his signature joke was take my wife please and that was his joke and I saw him do that joke in Milwaukee at Summerfest in the 80s. Wow. And it was like a four o'clock in the afternoon show. It's an outdoor music festival, one comedy stage. So there's Henny Youngman in the bright sunlight, and people are staring like, I don't. <laughs> and how did it and go? And I'm the only how one laughing. I'm like 18, and I'm laughing my ass off, and nobody else has. So any how did it go over? It went over it well. Did not, it no, did not go over. No, I'm wow. the o- I said I'm the only one laughing. Mm-hmm. Everyone else is like, this is weird. Yeah. Wow. So anyhow, Henny England. Another thing that really moves the meters with the young folks. You know, <laughs> we got to make sure we tag it, Henny Youngman, because no, so he listen, gets searched book, a lot book on Google. book is fantastic. It's gotten some amazing reviews, and it's about basically how a marriage can correlate with the rules of stand-up comedy. So we'll hear more about it. Danny Klein Modisette, the author, she happens to be both a comedian and she's married. So I'm going to assume that she's sort of an authority about this. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. Because she knows the comedy world and she's been married successfully. That sounds to me like like if if marriage is like comedy, then one of you is always shorting the other on money, saying you didn't sell enough drinks, (laughs) uh, doing cocaine off a a glass table that's been in a green room since 1983. No, 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 Hannes. I think she's talking about more stuff like timing. You know, like in a timing. marriage, timing Ti- in terms ti- timing. Of, of when to talk about what, maybe really listening, being present, stuff like that. So she's going to give us the rules huh? of that. I'm sorry, but first I wasn't we're going to hear her story about wedding anniversary nightmares. So yes, and by the way, that. this proves again my theory that nobody ever wants to hear, nobody wants to hear your wedding anniversary story when it went well. Right. Nobody wants to hear you about know, your vacation when it went well. That's very funny you should say that because recently, as you know, I have a blog in the Huffington Post. And that means I get paid. <coughs> humble brag. No, it means I get paid nothing. That's what that means. Exactly. But that's the point why the humble is, is part is I wrote an article about this experience I had in Istanbul, Turkey a couple of weeks ago. Yes. In which I got ripped off in a cab. And one of the comments was, you come to the most beautiful country in the world and all you take away from it is a bad experience with one cab driver. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not writing a fucking travel blog yeah. and this pissed me off and if you wanted me to just to brag about the places I've been I'm not going to have right, any fans right and nobody absolute, gives a shit about yeah, your good and, vacation and yeah you had told me the story and it's like before that you were like well we were in this cafe and we met this very nice person and, the, and, I, and I was bored I know bored. you don't give a shit you don't it's care like, about oh the my Greek God. islands All I know I, you I know, it. no it was like hey they, I went to a gorgeous place well I didn't yeah I but know, I get it. you got screwed in a very elaborate, you should read the article, because it's a very Thank elaborate you, scam. It's not like some guy overcharged you in a money that you don't understand. It's like, this was like, remember the mo- remember the show Banachek? Nobody. I have no nobody, idea what just And happened. a George no. Papard. No, another. This is even a, more obscure than Honey. It was a sleight of hand is what it was. Yes, exactly. But involving various people. And uh, so, right. and yeah, that's right. Like uh, our uh, my friend Robin Roberts, comedian uh, and uh, songwriter, she had a song about going to Malta, and the song was it's kind of a weird song. It's a song about the fact that you can't get fresh produce in Malta. Yeah. It was an interesting take because, like, I you know I like to eat produce and they have nothing but canned stuff. And she puts it up on YouTube like this is a funny song, right? And people in Malta are like, "How dare you!" I, it's like, really, <laughs> really, is that? Do you have is do you have nothing to do? Like the person who wrote you, do you have nothing to do but well, try and, and find also, something and then go, hey, yeah, like you're just waiting for people to complain about Turkey. Yeah. What? 
<laughs> what? I also find that the blog posts they accept are ones in which there's a bit of controversy or interest. If they just wanted something, a nice piece about, you know, Turkey, th- that's not going to come you. from that's me. What that's going to be somebody writing no, for Frommers they don't or want the a Lonely nice Planet. Pe- that's what I was going to say. It's like they have no interest right. in like – Turkey is a nice place to go is not a headline that's clickbait. Nobody's clicking through <laughs> to Turkey is a nice place to go unless they happen to be going to Turkey the next week. Would you like to na- know the name of my article? Fucked over in Turkey? <laughs> Istanbul is a shithole? Oh, my gosh. No. That's not true. It's a beautiful city. No, but it's called Ripped Off in Istanbul. Yeah. yeah. And you know what's also funny, quickly, uh, to add to that is that I recently Googled cab drivers in Istanbul, and the whole fucking scam is right there. Like, I, I can't believe I didn't do it. Well, I can believe I didn't why do it would beforehand. You, be right, pretty... because I'm traveling, and I've got some money, and I can I don't mind spending some money uh, there. Yeah. And so it just, didn't, it just didn't occur to me that they would want more money than I wanted to spend yeah i don't know and it's like, that's really specific it's like I'm i so yeah naive. see i don't want to go any place where i have to google scams in yeah well that's everywhere now that i've i figured that out yeah anyway you guys this is exciting that danny's here we're gonna hear her story about wedding anniversaries maybe she had one in istanbul if she I went to istanbul know. i'm gonna shit this myself this whole show is really gonna come together but listen folks and then before... i'll smell like i live in istanbul before oh see danny... what why am i so mean did i tell you that everybody smokes in turkey no, 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 no. Just to cover not, the body over. Not a lot of people smoke in Turkey. Listen to Every, me. Babies. Everybody smokes yes. in Turkey. The average age of death, 63. Why did they die in Turkey? Well, one in three are dying of cigarette smoke. So there you go. Why do they smoke? Because they live in Turkey and like, I can't do this for more than 63 years. By the years. way, you know what they eat very frequently? And this is not, I'm not uh, dissing this. This is just what they eat. So oh, wait, let me guess. People, let me think of a of real answer. eat crazy stuff what all they, over the world. What do they eat that we, eat that we would, all the time. something Americans would not eat? You eat, irregu- Camel? No. You eat irregular pear halves out of cans, am yeah, I right? Exactly, with a spork. Uh, that that po- is an old callback, baby. <laughs> <laughs> that comes from five years ago of podcasting. This is for our real friends. This is from our, like our Patreon fans. That's our who, Patreon who would fans. know that. Why we could even name them? <laughs> you know, recently we've gotten a lot of great support <clears throat> from our Patreon campaign. Why don't you? Why don't you thank those people, Hannes? Well, our Patreon supporters include Dave Sheckman, Stu Gillickson. <laughs> Patty Woods, Lisa <laughs> Allen. I feel like I'm on PBS yeah, right now. I know you're saying these people's names as if they're not. And they're, they're coming out. The door okay. And accept some. You know, in the Academy Awards, when they introduce the uh, the accountants who have the uh, the account, you know, that's know. that's what I'm doing. Amanda Raven, or is it Raven? I think it's Raven. Raven and our my favorites, Dan Swallow, <laughs> and Jay Cock. <laughs> <laughs> Swallow and cock. You know, what in Istanbul, if you go to vaudeville. You? What is wrong with you? I'm, these people are giving us money, and I'm making fun of their names. This, you think I would know better. You guys, listen, follow us on Twitter and on Instagram, at Storyworthy. And, of course, we're over on Facebook. You can follow us there as well. Yeah. All right, you guys, wherever you are, stick around, because Danny klein said is on her way here. Next time on Storyworthy, we have writer David Wilde. And I'll be talking about my very strange moon dance with Van Morrison. That's next time on Storyworthy. This is Jimmy Dore. You're listening to the Storyworthy Podcast. And we're back. We have left Turner Hall, and now it's like 3 o'clock in the morning. The party's over. We're drunk, and we need food. So we've gone to Ma Fisher's over on Prospect Avenue. We've been here like four or we've five been, times. Ma Fisher's Easy. is where I used to go with my grandma. I know. She would eat half of her sandwich, wrap the other one up in a paper napkin like that was going to save it, <laughs> and then take the entire basket of Melba toast and breadsticks <laughs> and pour it into her purse. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a it was like at least a good foot long this basket. So you go to her house and you'd be like you'd have stale cake or sandwiches and Melba toast. In those little tiny wrappers. In little wrappers. They were fresh. Yeah. She she never connected. Ironically, the stale food was fresh. I know. She never connected the fact that they wrapped that up in plastic and cellophane with maybe you need a piece of wax paper for the sandwich. Wax paper, that's what you go to? What about it's a my Ziploc, grandma. What about a Ziploc bag? And what is she supposed to take her own plastic bag? What are you talking about? You're All she has to just is a napkin. Eat the food. That's Why what doesn't she ask for a doggy bag or you know something a container? Uh, because she grew up. She she lived through the depression, so she froze everything. She would give you a piece of cake that had been frozen since 
the Theodore Roosevelt administration. <laughs> I'm like, thanks, Grandma. My grand- Wait a minute. All right. Once I stayed over. I was a little kid. I stayed at her house overnight, and I had to go to school in the morning. She had to make me lunch. She made me ring bologna. Not bologna. Ring bologna. I don't know what that means. Ring bologna is like it looks like an actual sausage, and you cut it into slices, big, thick, irregular slices yeah. with onion, mayonnaise, on raisin bread. Oh, God. That is so fun. And I was like 10, and I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> I got I got to school. I'm like, and of course, it, she wrapped it in the raisin bread bag. Oh. Like, you know, that's you never throw anything that away. That is so humiliating. I mean, no <clears throat> wonder why as a child you'd feel like an outsider. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But what see, kind your of daughter, is that? you're sending all sorts of wonderful things. She's finding ways to be embarrassed by them. Yeah. Did I tell you she's been wearing glasses recently? And she doesn't wear glasses. She got a hold of my Halloween costume glasses. Yeah. And now she just wears those all you the time. You tell her that's bullshit. That's like walking with a cane in front of <laughs> crippled people. <laughs> I need glasses. What, is she yeah. going to get a wheelchair? Said, no, and then she pulls her hair back in the little one ponytail in the back. She's like looking like she's smart. You know what I mean? Like she's trying to be like. I do have an ancient joke about in my cute. act about all you have to do is put glasses on Arnold Schwarzenegger. You're like, oh, so you're a scientist now. Yeah, it's pretty cute, actually. Okay, Dr. Sylvester Stallone. All right, you guys. She's here right now. Danny. Is she? I think she left. Nanny Klein Mata said, like I said, she's a writer and a comedian, and she's the author of the new book, Take My Spouse, Please, How to Keep Your Marriage Happy, Healthy, and Thrive by following the rules of comedy. And it was named LA Magazine's top seven books to read this past summer. Did you hear that, Honest? Top seven. That's pretty good. That's odd. You, you know, that would piss me off if I was eight. <laughs> and you're like, really? Not top ten, you fuckers? Danny is <laughs> top also, seven? Danny's also the editor of the anthology Afterbirth, Stories You Won't Read in a Parenting Magazine. And her writing is uh, By the been... way, on, t- on behalf of all men, I just like to say, you. <sighs> Honest, grow up. I, after birth? No. <laughs> No, <laughs> I've got like I've what? dealt with a lot of vaginal things in my life, but after birth, I'm like I'm out. I have a friend who ate her placenta. Have you heard of that? I've heard of it. I've heard the uh, yes, I've heard that many times. Anyway, and let's go back. Damn to Danny. hippies, Danny. Her writing has also been featured in New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Parents Magazine, L.A. Parent Magazine, and the Huffington Post. And you can find her at DannyKlein.com and over on Twitter at Danny Klein. All right, you guys, wherever what you are. What about afterbirth.com? Does <laughs> she have any affiliation? No. All right, you guys, wherever you are. Put your hands together for Danny Klein Modesto. Oh, yay. Applause. In house applause. Ooh. Ah, s- I mean, yay. I'm booing myself. Wait a minute. S- boo. Like I'm like the evil. I've come in to take out money in the old timey. Wasn't that right? In the old timey black and white movies. It's before your time, audience. During the with day the of the. Yes, with the mustache, Hans. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, exactly. At least you get my references. I know. <laughs> Yes, hi. Am I supposed hi. to say yes, something please. important? No, no, no. Please go right ahead. Oh, I'm supposed to start reading. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Here we go. In October of 2002, we, my husband and I, were in Santa Barbara celebrating our second anniversary. We were at a low-end hotel whose name had the word Cliff in it, probably something like Cliff's Edge, since the establishment, featuring prison cell-like rooms and mildewed carpet, was located on a cliff jutting out over the ocean. This was why I had booked the place. For me, as a native New Yorker, hotels perched on top of the ocean still give me a thrill, even ones that look like they might rent out their rooms by the hour. Todd, however, being from Southern California, wasn't quite as excited. When he opened the door to our room, he was hit with a blast of chemically freshened air, trying hard to mask the odor of the cigarette smoke trapped in the faded yellow curtains. He quietly asked me, where did you find this place? He gripped his bag in his hand, hoping he could turn around and leave me as soon as I gave him the go-ahead. But I was five months pregnant, so the place smelled even worse to me than it did to him. I, however, was willing to hold my nose for a few days for the chance to stare out at the one large window framing a piece of dark blue ocean where the waves crested and broke. I've always been a sucker for moving water. I used to drag my father to the window of a jacuzzi store on First Avenue when I was in preschool just to stare at the swirling eddies in the bathtubs for sale. Todd, we can't leave. It's our anniversary. This place is gross, he said, dropping his bag with a thud. I guess, I said, my eyes transfixed by the ocean outside the window. Fine. I'm going to check out the pool. I hope there's nobody floating face down in it. Ten minutes later, still sitting in front of the glass, I heard his footsteps. There's a ping pong table, honey. Pong, he said, followed by what looked disturbingly like a fist pump. Todd is a former member of a fraternity. I married a frat boy. There. 
it's in print. I wasn't the sorority type. I didn't. I did go to a few rush meetings my junior year, however, but mostly for the free cake and diet coke, mm-hmm. or for the free coke and diet cake depending on my mood. Todd, on the other hand, knew Greek life intimately. Fraternity life for him was a lot of drinking, chasing girls, and playing beer pong. During his fraternity years, Todd had honed his ping pong skills, and now the game would hopefully salvage our weekend. He could now relax knowing we'd be a carefree, frolicking couple playing ping pong. He'd get to nurse a Coors while his pregnant wife sips cranberry juice and soda, the two of us playing table tennis overlooking the Pacific Ocean. What could be more relaxing? Ten minutes later, I was standing at the ping pong table. Did you just slam the ball at my stomach? I snapped, trying to stay calm after my fetus had just been assaulted by a small white ball. What are you talking about? That was nothing. Come on, let's play. Eight to seven, my serve. Since we had only been together a little over three years, I hadn't yet seen the full extent of my supposedly California boy husband's competitiveness. Playing ping pong with him while carrying his baby would not have been my first choice for the best time to discover his killer instinct. You just slammed the ball at my stomach, I said, swerving my middle to the right to avoid being hit by the next ball. You do realize there's a baby in here, right? I'm done. I'm not playing with you, I said, laying my paddle down. What? Come on, don't be like that, he said, bending his knees and leaning into the table in proper pong position for the next serve. You're being ridiculous. I didn't slam the ball. That's how you play the game. I mean, are you playing or are you playing? (laughs) I started walking back to our hotel room, making it pretty clear I wasn't playing. Here's a little bonus advice for the men folk. Don't ever say you're being ridiculous to a woman bearing your child if you're interested in having sex again with her anytime soon. Ten years later, my chest still tightens thinking about that game of table tennis. I wasn't one of those happy pregnant women with my first child. I felt overtaken and out of control. I didn't plow through dozens of pregnancy books in joyful anticipation of this new life I was creating. I was very scared. It was truly unbelievable to me that all you do is have sex and eat and you make an entirely new human being. I wondered a lot about what I would do if my baby died. Being pregnant felt like the biggest setup ever to screw up in some permanent and unforeseeable way. So a ball, even one weighing less than three grams, careening at my stomach, possibly the baby's head, made me nuts. I was also not very good at managing my expectations. I couldn't believe Todd didn't A, knew this was how I felt, and B, feel exactly the same way. Wasn't that the whole point of being married? To have someone who knows you well enough to read your thoughts and who feels exactly the same way you do about everything? Never mind that every woman's magazine I'd read had advice columns telling me not to expect this. I was convinced that my husband and my marriage were going to be different. I went back to the room, this time oblivious to the soothing ocean. I packed what little I had pulled out and lumbered to the parking lot, When I and when I got there, panting, I saw a film of sea salt and dust had already settled on the car. If I left in this car, Todd would be stuck in Santa Barbara, three hours from our apartment. I couldn't do it. He was, after all, the father of my fetus. I dragged my bag back to the room, spread myself out on the bed, and ate saltines until I passed out. When I woke up, Todd was getting out of the shower, wrapped in a seedy hotel robe, the moonlight reflecting on the water behind him. What can I say? I'm a competitive guy, he said, (laughs) coming over and sitting next to me on the bed. And I'm kind of fantastic, he added, smiling and wiggling his eyebrows. Come on, don't be mad at me. Let me rub your feet, he continued after a beat, grabbing one of my bloated hooves, which he somehow didn't find repulsive. I surrendered to the foot massage, took some deep breaths, thought about ordering room service, then remembered there was none, and sent him out to the nearest 7-Eleven for cottage cheese, green apples, and chocolate chip cookie dough. We did end up relaxing a little in the next 24 hours, but typical of us, not without a lot of kicking and screaming. Over the years, we figured out that relaxing together isn't one of our strengths as a couple particularly when it involves sports, since it's always possible that one of us will unexpectedly turn into a competitive freak. So we have other ways. Sometimes we find a TV program we can both enjoy, one where no babies or children are held hostage so I can sit through it, but there's enough history or action or science fiction to keep Todd interested. 
for those one or two shows a year, we curl up on the couch together, fingers entwined, and enjoy at least 20 minutes of it before I fall asleep. Ah, that's very sweet. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. How long have you been married? Oh, 14 years this month. Wow. Hopefully. Ha, yeah, in, kidding. And in L.A. years, that's like that's like 52 Dog years. Dog years, I baby. mean, honestly, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So tell me, what was your best anniversary? Oh, my gosh. Maybe this year because I'm going to be on a plane to Memphis. Oh, oh. no, that's so... That, yeah. <laughs> I'm supposed to be the happy married person. No. Um, the best anniversary. I think happy married people are often on a plane to Memphis. No. I mean, I think the uh, actually for us, just because our anniversaries are notably bad because they're so stressful, I think the ones I don't remember are probably the better ones. Like yeah. the ones that are just sweet and go to dinner and. But I think going hands. away to Santa Barbara for a couple of days is sweet. Yeah, it would have been. For yeah. the. Yeah. yeah. You know, I have to say, because you, your his reaction to the room is like. This is one time when uh, Christine used to have a cabin up at uh, Big Bear. And so uh, me and Sherry go up to, uh, and it's like, well, we'll find a hotel room when we find some hotel, the only one in town. And it's a fucking hellhole. <laughs> was that the Black Forest Lodge? Yes. I told it, you. No, you said it's bad. And I was like, ah, how bad could it be? Right. <laughs> it was like individual like cabins, but just that had been... Like built by prisoners or something. Yeah, I don't no, know. When it's it depressing, like there was there was soot. There was a fireplace. I'm like fireplace, awesome. Yeah, somebody burned a fire in the fireplace without opening the flue, so there was black soot inside the room going up on the thing. It's like, oh, we're not going to clean that off. This is the mountains, so it's like the whole room smells like an arson scene. Right, right. And it, this happened <laughs> years ago, and it was like, oh, right. My and I think God. that was Todd's point like he, he didn't want to be there I mean it smelled it was mildew it was gross I literally was just transfixed by the window and the ocean and yeah yes. you know so Santa Barbara has so many places like that so many places are outdated like it's a great place to go for the weekend but if you want like a contemporary cool hotel it's not going to be in Santa Barbara yeah I guess unless you're at that one that's like the Four Seasons yeah there's one, one there's one on the beach Baccarat or right Baccarat but, Baccara. but even that though I believe was kind of the heyday was in the 70s oh really oh Dear. And then it's been remodeled, perhaps. But the point is, is why did you choose that? Yeah, place? they still Just have because they still it... have a Sambo's. There's a Sambo's <laughs> restaurant in Santa Barbara. Yeah, Santa oh, Barbara I that's so out of date there. No, I chose reason, it yeah. literally because it was. I thought it was cool the that it was on a rock. It. You're better <laughs> off going down to um, San Diego. I'm just between you and oh, I. Or, oh, interesting. Or, or um, Laguna, which is my favorite. Laguna is gorgeous. Laguna. I, I have to say, I would never think of vacationing in San Diego. My son was on a game show once, and he won, and it was like very competitive. And then and they were holding out for like the the prize the prize yeah, yeah. and then they said the announcer came on yeah, and he and was like you get and you too. get two days in San Diego <laughs> and like we just started laughing like you're See, kidding but in the rest of the country and in fact the rest of the world that's quite desirable because as you know San Diego like it's beautiful it's temperate well, the wait, weather wait. is wonderful when you were on the it's, dating game it's very white it's yeah, very, very white, white especially in the proximity not that I'm of not Mexico. white ladies and gentlemen but, well, no, but it's enough it, already it's conservative. <laughs> <laughs> I think you you mean like conservative white. Yeah, I guess. Because everything there isn't bi bilingual. And, you know, you're yeah. right next, it's only it's six miles to Mexico. Oh, you're right. Uh, I'm no, no, wrong. No, 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 no. You're talking about, in other words, it's not white uh, with, with your eyes looking at white. It's not just white people. You're talking right. about the conservatism. I the think conservative I am talking nature. about that. Thank you for clarifying. Because, like, the Republican National Party, they've had their conventions there. That's what I think you're saying. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Wait, Hannes is talking about I won yeah. the dating game. Yeah. We won our trip. They said, Congratulations, Christine and Jeff. You're going to Tucson, Arizona. Okay, there you go. And you I want to go there. What? Yeah. yeah. And I, like... I did go, but not with a guy I won the trip with. Oh, wait. I went with another guy. Oh, why? how did they allow that? Because you each win the trip. You each oh, win a you trip don't have to go two. together. No. Now, you could take a chaperone like they did in the 70s, <laughs> or you could just take your own trip. Oh, wow. Isn't that did anyone actually go together, though? That uh, was like the I, precursor I to The Bachelor, wasn't it, that show, essentially? The, the, the dating game. Yeah, that's a good That's a good reference, except that, yeah, The Bachelor is so much more well, they actually the actual fuck. dates. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I say that? Yeah, please oh, okay. do. We, we, please do. Please we, say fuck. No, no, no. Okay. We can only Very say good. cock and swallow, mm -hmm. oh, but that's we right, can't cock. say fuck. No, the thing with The Bachelor, though, is it's the actual date. The dating game was before they go on the date. Right, but the idea of setting two people up 
together who yeah. you know or both want to be on television. Yeah, I, I suppose. <laughs> I suppose. Yeah, that was it, like the gateway because when you think of like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Ron Howard, Suzanne Somers, Farrah Fawcett, all those people were on the were dating, on the dating game. game. Wow. Yeah. And so yeah, with that in How mind, fun. I think that that was, and that's what I thought. I thought I'm going to go on the dating game. Right. I'm going to win, and then that's it. I'm I'm on my way. Okay. And that, sure. that, believe it or not, it didn't happen like Charlie's that. Charlie's Angels. Here What's we are, next? 18 years later. Yeah. Yeah. Podcasting. Yeah. Podcasting for big dough. Listen, this yeah. is exciting. Your new book, Take My Spouse, Please, has gotten so many great reviews, including yeah. from Carl Reiner, who says, marry someone who can stand being with you. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you make <laughs> of this that? This is good advice. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I make of it is, you know, I interviewed over 100 couples, and, uh, you know, it's a lot about perseverance. It's very similar to um, being a comic, which is why I draw the analogy uh, why the book was re- even written, because it takes perseverance. It takes showing up. It takes letting go of a bad night, which is essentially what that kind of quote says. Like, you have to be able to. You know, stand yeah. each other to let it go, to just move through yeah. it. You don't, know, not just let one or two bad exactly. experiences like blow it out. Exactly, like, you don't want to define the relationship by yeah. its worst moment. Yeah, you, you can't really it. hold a grudge. I like no. that. You can't define it by its worst moments. Are you listening, Turkey hater? <laughs> But did you Istanbul? <laughs> no. no, yeah. She no, hates I Istanbul. Oh, that's a callback. I get it. Back. I get comedy. I had call a wonderful back. trip to Turkey, and I love everything about Turkey. But nobody cares about a pleasant experience. That's why I wrote about the cab experience. Oh well, I will tell you. Yes. Yes. Just because I have to interrupt here, that Please. one of the one person who read this book because I talk to happy couples. Yeah. Like it's a whole idea is to like be inspired. I'm learn. all about yeah. inspiring yeah. people. Yeah. And I did have one one woman say to me, "Well, why? You know, that book made me cry. Like, why didn't you?" have more unhappy why didn't you have more people like me who aren't happy wow. <laughs> she didn't understand that it's for her well not yeah, about it her. Was, it's very like if you're it was just like a, she wanted people who were miserable to read about yeah, if and, you're genuinely unhappy then you shouldn't be in that marriage well no if, if you're, you're that miserable no but i say there's everybody ups and downs and ins and outs and bad things it's like if you're actually literally defining yourself as a miserable person and you're assigning that to your marriage, and, then that's and a sign you're not that... willing to work on it, and your partner's not willing to work on yeah, it. Yeah, in other words, exactly. you're not a psychologist. You're not coming at this book like you know. You're t- you're not a therapist. You're not no, a therapist. although I did interview quite a few therapists. Like there is legitimate resources in this book. Right, it's right. not um, a Mindy Kaling, Tina Fey, Chelsea Handler. Oh book. no, no, no! Like, this there, is full it's, on practical. There are no yes. nude photographs. Here's in something this book? you Wait talk a about, which I really appreciate, um, and that is about timing. You know, timing, is timing, everything. T- and timing. picking your moment about when to talk, yes. when to fight, saying, is it a good time yes. to talk about this? Yes. I actually break the timing down into macro and micro. I steal from the business school vernacular. Okay, Don't laugh at me, no, 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 I'm not laughing. I'm, um, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to take notes. Give, okay, good. I hear. Um, about kind of the macro level timing being, you know, when you buy a house together, when you start to have try to have a baby and all those bigger yes. timing factors. But really, I think for the fabric of a marriage, it's the micro timing. It's the, you know, don't talk about property taxes during the Super Bowl. Like, how about not do that, you know, and be conscious. Of Finally, the- some good advice. <laughs> uh, you know, be conscious of when you're communicating with each other. So you give yourself a chance to be present and all the other things that I talk about in the book. And what about um, what about being kind, you know, uh, you know, being straight on kind and being honest? Well, being honest, for sure. I mean, you know, when you're comparing it to stand up, like if you're not honest, if you're not saying what's in the room, as a comedian, the audience mm-hmm. feels yep. like this. Wait, this, I, this is not truthful, right? So it's very important to be truthful in uh, in anything that you do, in my opinion. But certainly in a marriage, otherwise you build up resentment and you hide so it. So you're both you know. in the kitchen. One person is chopping vegetables, and the other person says, "Hey, listen, honey, this weekend mm-hmm. I know we were supposed to go to the movie, but I just I don't, you know." So something <laughs> happens right there. And the husband says, okay, or whatever, and he doesn't draw attention to, wait a minute, this isn't right. In other, are, are, in other words, are you saying, in terms of being honest and being kind, you got to stop him right there in the moment and try to go back? Um, I, I'm not understanding your question. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sorry. Sure either. I'll try again. Yeah. I mean, in terms of. You know, I talked to you about unclear questions. Okay, bad timing. Bad timing. <laughs> okay, bad, bad timing. What no. you're speaking to, actually, though, Christine, is about showing up, which is chapter one. If I want to go to the movies, and I. I mean, the movies is a bit frivolous, but nevertheless, we can use it as an example. And it's a, like, I really want to see that Steve Jobs movie, right? right? And I've been talking about it since they've been running the ads. Right. Now, 
if my husband understand, and we have a date this Saturday night to go and I book a sitter and then for whatever reason my husband's not in the mood, I don't want to go, I, I don't feel like it. If he understands that it's something that really matters to me, again, a movie, bad example, but Let's run with it still. He understands that I've been looking forward to this. And I, then he, as as a good spouse, would just kind of suck it up and show up for me for right, that. Right. And in turn, I would then go to his, you know, uh, party with his group of, you know, his work party that maybe I don't want to go to. But that is part of being in a, ma- a healthy maybe marriage. And not saying it and having to point it out. Maybe trying to just suck it up. You know what I mean? And not have to say something you might later, later regret. Oh, well, absolutely. The biggest thing that came out of all of the research was, you know, uh, the comedian Lou Schneider saying to me, you, uh, you will never regret something you didn't say, mm. but you may regret something you said. So this whole idea, and they've been, he and his wife have been married like 30 years, or certainly together 30 years, and this whole idea of like think before you speak, like you don't, this was a great revelation for me as a comedian too, that like, you know, you don't have to say the first thing that comes into your mind, as opposed to when you're doing a set and you're it's live and people are hoping that you'll just like call some outrageous thing out in the moment because that's what they're paying for yeah. is for you to say the shit they can't say mm-hmm. and don't want to say in a marriage. You know, it doesn't it's not the most helpful tool. Like you yeah. really do need to take take a so second. What's that I've under, heard this. What, what, what's that under in your book? What chapter is that under? Oh, my goodness. I think that is, is under, it like bite your tongue. That's, no, it's not called bite your tongue. It's definitely <laughs> shut not called the bite fuck up. <laughs> That's, well, I think it's his, probably under. Shut it, the fuck up, hers. It's two separate chapters. I think it's probably under timing. I mean, I think that has to do with timing. Well, I've you heard know, this. Like, yeah, I've heard this expressed a different way, which is simply, does this every time you're going to say something, you think, does this need to be said? Right. Just in real like life, that. does this really? Well, need, I, actually I talk suffer about from that. saying things that don't need to be. Well, said. Well, how about this, Hannes? Yes. It's does it need to be said? Does it need to be said now? Does it need to be said by me? Mm. Oh, right. There's See, I shortened three it in my part. head. You're right. There is there are three parts. And um and also Christine, just to get back to, I think it's probably under have patience mm-hmm. too. It's like be thoughtful, and be careful what you say. Yeah, not you don't want to be careful to the extent that you're editing yourself because you have to be authentic in your marriage. And I definitely talk about finding your voice as a couple, which you know we talk a lot about as a comedian is finding your voice and your authentic self. Mm-hmm. And I think a couple has to get to that place where they have a groove, where they have a voice, where they have a way of communicating. So what about sex in a marriage? And what is chapter that to, three, Christine? What chapter does that three have to do with being on stage because um, wait, does real this quick. need to have me to have sex with? Does it need to have sex because? By me, no, okay. Nah, intuitively, or because by its nature, a stand-up comedian is alone. Yes, a masturbator, as it were. Yes, frequently so, at all hotel rooms across the country. I guess I don't know. Country. I don't know about that, but I I say that you know, sex is to marriage what jokes are to an audience. Without it, everybody gets restless. Yeah, no <laughs> like, good, no good. Like have sex, folks. That's yeah. like chapter three. I would have made it chapter one, but I'm not like a sex therapist. But yeah. um, uh, that's my experience. Like ma- when you talk to married people and they haven't had sex in two years, or it's trouble. It's really uh, you're on very thin ice. To it's almost over. So what do your kids think of your book? Oh, I think they like it a lot. They've been incredibly, uh, my my older one has, he does my Instagram for me and he's been to a lot of uh, the readings. That's so sweet. Yeah, and he's really into it. He knows the story. He knows a couple of these stories. He's read the book. No, he's 12. Uh, but, but he could read the book. He, Obviously, he, he could reads. read the book. Yeah. Oh, yes. He reads. Yes. No, but I mean, I would think <laughs> that, my eight-year-old could read it. I um, would think though <laughs> that there's a lot in it that he might just. Well, no. I mean, my daughter hasn't read my book, so I mean, I, I you know, oh, right. she's only eight. Uh, she could read some of the chapters. Uh, some of them I would not recommend. Yeah. No. He her, could. But you. Yeah. This anybody could read this book. It's yeah. very positive. Um, what has been interesting to me about it, and I just had it confirmed again yesterday, as some single woman wrote to me, and she's like, there. I'm 33 and I'm single and thank God I found your book because I think you should teach a seminar to single women. This is so great. And clearly that was not my intention when I wrote it. I thought I was writing a book for married people Mm -hmm. to kind of celebrate long-term marriage because I have all these interviews with Patricia Heaton Mm -hmm. and long-term married people. And so it it has surprised me how much... Well, Danny Klein Modisette, why don't you look at Christine Blackbird's notes right here, which says that you should give advice for new relationships and single people. Look, it's right there. I know. Well, I just got an email about that yesterday. It's so funny. Well, here's the thing, Danny. You've I'm done, ready. You've done Afterbirth, which mm-hmm. was the collection of parenting stories. Mm-hmm. And now you've done this book on marriage, essentially. So yes. next, you know, perhaps talk about, yeah, people who are single. Or what about childhood? 
What about you, or, be, you, raising your children? You know, now that you're in it, not just after birth, well, not just when they're brand new babies, but now that they're children. Okay. Well, after birth, just to be clear, was not only stories about babies. It actually spanned the lifespan of children. I see. And um, because uh, that was an anthology of stories, and the the it actually goes in chronology in chronological I order. See, I, see. <laughs> um, I think there's a couple uh, feelings that I have about this. I'm about to do an 11 city book tour with this book, yeah. so um, I will probably stay on this topic for the next six months. Uh, but I do feel that laughter throughout your life. I don't think it necessarily has to be limited to your relationships. I mean, mm -hmm. I think the what I'm talking about in this book and what I've talked about throughout my career is the importance of maintaining a sense of humor throughout your life, in all areas of your life. And uh, that would be the next likely You could place take Hannes on as a project. Do you know what I mean? Hannes has a no, sense no, no. of humor. My, my problems never stem from not having a sense of humor. Yes, that right. would probably... I always see the humor in things. Yeah. I just don't see the good in things. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's tough cuz you do I have a chapter about like sticking with the winners, you know, like st like surrounding yourself as as comedians too, right? Yeah. Like surrounding yourself with positive people who yes. cuz it's so easy to sit around and say, "Oh, that gig sucked and that that room sucks and those people couldn't laugh at anything," you know. And it's the same I thing do in marriage. Comedians especially love to blame the audience yeah and sometimes it's completely true but not every time yeah sometimes you just did a poor job or sometimes you never should have been doing that gig in the first right. place. right or it's just not a not a fit you yeah know? it's a, um, yeah every comedian is so egotistical in a way they're like i can make anybody laugh you know what if you're like a super liberal comedian and you play a sure. group of elderly gun owners they're not going to laugh at you yeah it's it's not yeah. that it's just not right it's not it's the wrong fit right Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Now, do you think stand up is the hardest thing to do, or do you think marriage is the hardest thing to marriage, do? Marriage, that's why marriage I wrote the book. Is harder uh, for me personally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think it's, it's it depends on the person, but that was the whole impetus for for the book was yeah. people saying to me, you know, stand up. That's the hardest thing in the world. That's the hardest thing in the world. And then I was like laying in my bed in the fetal position after a fight, thinking, really? Yeah, I don't, I don't think. I think maybe marriage is. A I, little harder. I have, yeah, because like, people are like, yeah, they'll say like, you know, you go up there by yourself. It's like it's hard compared to I don't know being in a play with 25 other people it's not hard compared to coal mining <laughs> it's not hard compared yeah. to not you know to, it's to, not yeah, to having one leg it's not hard compared to anything that's actually hard <laughs> it's not hard compared to like staying honest and faithful and connected to another human being for Get year ping pong balls flown at you exactly. by the way your your husband with the competitiveness I find that hilarious in men as a as an irritating quality the <laughs> Like, hey, come on, you playing or you're not playing? It's like, it's, it's a girl, she's pregnant and she's married to you, so I want you to shut the fuck up. Do you guys up. Like, have what? a ping pong table you now? Serious? No, we do I not. I love ping pong so much. No, we do and not. I just recently got one, but here's what you do. It, you don't actually get the ping pong table, you get this little kit. They, uh, Champion Sports makes it, and it comes in a little bag. It's $21. It, it's a portable <laughs> net that you can put onto any table. A portable net, that's yes, all I need. Two paddles, He'll put it in balls, our bed. Yeah. And it, I, bought, I bought one, and it was so good, I bought three more. More and I've been giving them around as gifts. Yeah, don't it's give fabulous. me one. I don't. Wow. I have like none of those people want those gifts. Ping none pong of them. is so much fun. No. I have post traumatic stress from that ping pong table story. Wow. I never. She have just hears ping like a bang off a table. She's wow. like, ah. I don't like it. It really like you know if Uber had been around, interesting, he would have been would have Ubering gone. back yeah. to. Yeah. Uh, I maybe really just the swiftness of it or something. You no, know what it I mean? was the force behind it. I had a yeah. feet. I was like, what? And he still won't really concede. I mean, he, he will say, okay, maybe that was, I see now, maybe that was a little rough. But, <laughs> but he really still thinks. No, like, yeah, he was like, that's just how you play the game. It's play. like, you're not playing a game. It's not, you're not in the Olympics. You're not Forrest Gump. All right, so it let, me, let me ask you. Now, if you're taking this girl's advice who wrote you this email and who, she was a single oh, girl. Oh, the 33-year-old, yeah. About, she's excited about the book. Yeah. Well, do you have any solid advice you can give somebody who is single and what they might do if they want to be in a serious relationship? Like, there's something that comes to mind that I recently read. Okay. That I, I feel is so um, accurate. And, and I was wondering if you... All right, well, you, you say of, yours first. You, you tell me something big first, and I'll tell you mine. Something big first. Yeah, and Authenticity. Words, that's authenticity. the only big thing. Okay, so... That is the only thing. Right. Authenticity. And so along those lines is what I'm thinking, which is you need to state your intention 
when you're before you even go out and i don't mean like on a dating site but when you're talking with somebody in terms of like what is your intention or after you meet with them wait you don't mean like sit down and say young man what is your intention <laughs> no but i mean kind of like <laughs> you know you, know, you just go you okay like no anal <laughs> right number right, one right. Okay, so let's say you're compatible with somebody, right? How do you then know that? Then it has to be. How well, do you know you, that? you go out. No, you do have to meet the person and go out, see that you're compatible. But then it has to be like, here's what I want. I want a, a, to date somebody who becomes a boyfriend, then Wait, perhaps Christine, marriage Wait, you, you're not saying sit down and say that out loud to a person you've known twice, you've gone out with twice? Well, I am thinking that it'd, it'd be better to know on the table. Like if, if somebody says, I want children, yeah. and somebody says, I don't want children, then that's a deal breaker. Yeah, but I think it takes time to get to know a person. Or if somebody says, "Look, I smoke cigarettes." Th- this oh my is what God! I wait, do. my husband if, smoked cigarettes when I met him. It was mind. disgusting. Oh, and now he, you changed him. I didn't change him. He made the choice oh, through okay. his to hide his cigarette smoking. No, my, for our when first, he's first my question was: Was it a deal breaker for you? It was clearly not. But oh, but it should have been. He was the only man I ever went out with who smoked cigarettes. But. It, that's what I mean. You can't be so like, it has to look like this. Right. If it has to look like this, there's a good chance you'll be alone. I don't mean to be too bitchy. No, I, I, no, no, no I don't think that's bitchy. I think that's fits- correct. There, I understand what Christine is saying, but I don't agree with it completely because like, no, what you're saying is you can't paint a picture of, see, this is a, a lot of women do this, I think. They yes. don't, they don't go out with men or, or decide who they're going to marry, they cast their lives. Exactly. Yeah. They have a d- description like when we get an audition, this person, is he's six foot tall, he yes. was a Navy SEAL, he was this. Right. And you have all these things, and you're never going to find that guy. Right. Or if you do, he's already married because he's six feet tall and he used to be a Navy SEAL. No, no. It's like Here's the you thing. have to be able to change what you want a little bit. Right. My I husband. agree. But some things like children, I just think, is one thing. Right. You, okay, look. If Christine, you never you're just... not going to have any more no, kids. No, no, no. Of course so. not. I'm not talking about okay. me. I'm Do not talking about me. we have to talk me. about your reproductive Dude, system? I'm 50 years old. I can't wow. have Wow. 50. You look great. Aren't you sweet? Um, I think that you can't. Uh, let me just say this. When I met my husband, he was t- almost 10 years young, nine years younger. He still is. Mm-hmm. Yes, um, <laughs> he uh, had a shaved head, an earring. He smoked cigarettes. He was wearing a black leather jacket. He was completely wrong for me. I mean, I, but le- you, I left. you were attracted to him. I thought he was cute. Yeah. I thought he was cute, and he was yeah. funny, and he was really smart. There you go. But um, I, le- I, did, I left. We met at a bar. I left. He followed, you know, called me, and I still said, no, you're crazy. You're young. Yeah. This is ridiculous, because I had an idea. Yeah. I was 36 years old. I was like, stop going out with young yeah. boys. Cut this shit. Find a grown-up better he should be from new york so at least you'll have something in common yeah. p.s my husband's from california yeah he was young he you know smoker like it was all wrong yeah. but you know what like 15 years later it was all it's all right that's so and sweet. so you can't have that is my advice like you can't have it can only look like this because you will always be disappointed yeah you, it will never be the way you see it you have to be present and that's the whole point of the book and that's the whole point of being a comic right that's how it's related okay you have to be present be present and and listen chapter two listen right show up Listen, but I would say this listen also sounds like podcasting advice. If somebody be present <laughs> and listen, <laughs> listen, right. right? If the building I fell say, down right now, guess... we wouldn't keep talking about my book. We would talk about the fact that the building was falling down. No, I, I would talk about your book because I would find that amusing as we just topple to the ground. Yeah, so tell us some more about the book. Uh, no, but I would say that so for women, if you would like children and you're going out with somebody who doesn't want children, I would say listen to that message. If he says he doesn't want children, well, that's don't think true. you're going to change his mind. Well, that that's is definitely what I was true. And at. Peop- I remember from my dating days, people, the, some advice person, Dr. Laura or Dr. Somebody with the, who's a fake doctor, saying, people tell you everything about themselves so you have to listen so if a guy says you know yeah people say I'm an asshole (laughs) well bingo like you're you're probably probably an an asshole asshole. you know or women say I I can't commit some good advice is to have your family and friends meet the person like there shouldn't be any fear in having other people meet oh well no of course not yeah Yeah. I mean I wouldn't say again like timing like how about let yourself know each other first just people are also always trying to because I was trying to think of something for for women and men, but it's like people are always trying to change other people. So it's like you know, 
yeah, you're so, if he says he's an asshole, he's probably an asshole. She goes, you know, everybody says I'm crazy. Right. She's probably right. crazy. Right. There's a reason. And it's like, you Although know what? people told my husband that I was crazy, and he was a little nervous about that. <laughs> <laughs> he he was. I, you're and not crazy. You're just from New York. No, I was a little crazy back then. Uh, I mean, I yeah, I but think he I mellowed out. A spark. Well, I don't know what he calls it because you know he doesn't do interviews. Who knows what he calls? Hey, it. Hey, listen, you want to play yeah. some shotgun story worthy? Uh, I think so. Music can only mean one thing. It's time for Shotgun Story Worthy. The game where our storyteller spins the story worthy wheel of truth and tells a true one minute story about the topic it lands on. So, everybody, say it with me Spin that wheel! California. That's my story, California. I have one minute. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so when I moved here, it was the first time I ever owned a car. And my father said, you'll never own a, you'll never, they'll never sell you a car. You don't have a job. And then I drove, because I belonged to SAG, and I got a loan from SAG on the spot, and I drove off the lot in a Toyota Tercel, which um, ended up actually saving my life literally. Because when my father died, and I was in New York, I had kept that car in storage in California. And I came out a month after he died, and I went to the storage unit and I had not unit wherever you storage place and I turned the key and the car started working wow. so that was why I was able to move back to California after he died as, as quickly as I was so that's my California car story I oh thank you very much you I'll hey, close with that, that. 44 good. seconds oh is that good seconds. yeah at one minute a shotgun well, blast comes yeah is that, so. oh in good other, in other words the point is is like anybody can tell a story in a minute you don't even need 10 minutes 15 minutes you no one minute you can get it out I was going to add the, about the part when the car got stolen. Oh, but. when did it get stolen? What happened then? <laughs> no, I love it. Uh, I lived in one of those California, Melrose Place kind of apartments. and Bungalow um, kind of a thing. Yes, with the uh, parking lot in the back. And I went and got groceries because I love the supermarkets here. I couldn't believe them. <laughs> they were like the size of a football field and everybody was so happy. So I went and I, and I put the keys in the door and I was in the kitchen unloading the groceries and I forgot that I had left the keys in the door and I came back out and my car was back, gone. Wow. It had been stolen from the back lot and um and it and called the cops and i was doing stand-up at the time and i was talking about it on stage and then i got a call like at three in the morning hey we found your car and i thought it was a comedian like fucking with me but it really was the cops and they had found my car and someone had taken it and then there were job applications in the front seat so they had like taken my car to go get a job that was so sweet oh you're such a liberal and then i got the car (laughs) and like i got it back and it was fine except you know it had like a huge garbage bag of lady stockings, Honest, multicolored did you steal stockings. Another car? Totally weird. I but I got know. the car back. That and, is so strange. And that was my story. It's like all the time. See, because that's just like a weird opportunity. Like a car thief is not wandering through a private parking lots thinking. I think the odds are good someone left their keys in the totally door. Totally weird. That is just somebody who walked by and said. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to take this car. Because it was probably like five minutes, maybe. You could have gone down there four hours later, and the car could have still been there with the keys in it. Right. Easily. Right. Oh, my gosh. It's just very weird to me. Totally weird. And I had to go to the, you know, I had to go down. This was the thing. I had to go down to the courtroom, and I had only ever been in a courtroom on the set of Matlock. Okay. (laughs) No joke. So you knew everything. Nice. So I'm like, did you and, solve the murder? And and I think like California. I was still new to California, so it all looked like a movie set to me. Everything. I'd only done that Matlock, and then I was there. And then um, they brought the guy in in the orange suit, and the judge looked at you know was looking at him as did you did you go? Oh, he said to me, did you give this man your keys? Because he had had my keys. So right. how could we prove it was a right, crime? Right. And I looked at him like I don't know, like I thought camera three was on me, and I like <laughs> stared at the guy, and I was like, no, I did. Good for you. Oh, good for me. Except he got off. They couldn't prove it. And I lived on a ground floor apartment with yeah. no bars on the windows. I used to call it the come on in and rape me suite. Oh. And like, I was like, oh my God, he got off? How did he get off? That's insane. He that stole my car. Insane. How long did you live in that apartment? Years. Oh, years. God. And then the police took me out to lunch. I was like, I'm not going home. He like, he's a free man and he knows where I live. But he never, you never saw him again, right? No, thank See, God. that's the thing about the difference between law and order and, <sighs> crazy. and in yeah. real life. In real life, 
You're never going to see that guy again. No. But in Law and Order, he's going to track down your whole family. <laughs> well, right. And, uh, it's like he's of never course. he's never going near that apartment building. And again. I had done two you episodes of Law know. and Order. So, <laughs> as like again, as an actor, you know, you're hag. You do these crime shows, and you're like, oh, my God. He's gonna... I'm surprised you didn't just burst into tears. <laughs> I this did. is good for my reel. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. <laughs> he took my car. Wait, I'm sorry. Let me try that again. <laughs> Listen, what do, you, what do you like more, acting or writing, by the way? Um, I Ping pong? really love to write because um, I love them both. I love performing. As I said, I'm doing this 11 city yeah, like yeah, yeah. tour. Um, but writing, you know, it's concrete. Like I'll have this book for the rest of my life yeah. and I don't have to worry about um, it's a body of work. It's yes. Done, yes. And it's a great feeling. And, you know, I love to prepare. I always prepare for auditions and prepare for everything. And then it goes into the ether. Like you do right. it for five people, you know, because you're auditioning or whatever next and, um, and it's gone. Right. And what I love about, um, writing is a you have it and b if you screw it up you hit delete and you yeah. do it again there's a beginning and a middle and an end and you have something yeah I but feel i feel that way about artwork and painting and stuff sure well you i do don't it then it. it's done and, and look at that that's mine and then yes. you at least yes. have something yes and or you can have a chance to fix it and right and you own it yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, it's all good, though. Well, I think... thank you so much oh, for coming today. Thank you. We really you. appreciate you coming. Really, the book is so exciting. Take My Spouse, please. Thank you. A and... great book, not just for married people, but right. for people who are thinking of getting married, perhaps would like to get married. Sure right. thing. Some very nice tips or, in there. Or maybe single people who really are like, just want to laugh. At married people. Yes. Yeah, anything. <laughs> All right, you guys. Yes. We want to thank everybody here at Sideshow Network, including Andrew Stephen. Thanks, Andrew. And thank you to Roddy Swearingen and Sean Merrick. And, of course, on behalf of John Thomas Griffith, you know, he's the guy that wrote the theme song, Follow Me. I refuse to acknowledge his existence. <laughs> and I'd also like to thank one more time our storyteller tonight, Danny Klein. Modest it. Thank you again for coming. Thank you. And on behalf of you, Hannah Spinney, my dear friend and co-host, my name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it the story worthy week. you can Thanks for joining us on the Storyworthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Storyworthy on iTunes and visit the Storyworthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Membership fees apply after free trial. Cancel any time. Can I be real for a second? That goal you have to exercise and eat better, you really can do it. But nobody is going to do it for you. And nobody has to because you can do it if you have the right tools and a community that cares about helping you get results. And that's us, Beachbody. It's as convenient as your TV or laptop, but you need to decide that you're worth it. Let us help you succeed. Here's how. Go to Beachbody.com to claim your free membership and start feeling great. Progressive Snapshot can save you money based on how you drive and how much you drive. So the safer you drive, the more money you could save. Now, if you didn't hear that because you were looking at your phone while driving, let me say it again. Seriously, put down your phone. That is so unsafe. If you didn't do stuff like use your phone while driving, you could save money with Progressive Snapshot. But saving or not, just put it down. And if you did hear it the first time because you weren't looking at your phone, nice work. You'd love Snapshot from Progressive because it rewards safe drivers. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Snapshot not available in California and North Carolina or from all agents.